Yes, thank you. Hello. Uh, good evening. I'm Randall Albers, uh, board president of the Chicago Literary Hall of Fame. Tonight's audience, I understand, includes people from New York to California, from Chicago to Texas, and from Mexico to Malaysia. I'm grateful for the virtual connection with you, viral storm or no, for this, our largest CLHOF event ever. We're pushing 1,500 people, so we each other, okay? On behalf of the Chicago Literary Hall of Fame, as well as tonight's co-presenters, the American Writers Museum, the Chicago Public Library, and the National Museum of Mexican Art, and two dozen partners from Chicago's great literary community, I welcome all of you in whatever part of the world you are watching to tonight's Fuller Awards ceremony. And now I ask you to please join me in offering a special welcome to our honoree coming to us from San Miguel de Allende, that we can't hear all of you in the audience cheering, please do so as I bring you Sandra Cisneros. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> I, I, was, I was saying this is like, this is your life. Remember that TV program? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I saw all the sponsors and the speakers. And the best part is I'm not even dead. Yeah, I know. I think I did hear cheering from all around the world. Didn't you hear that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I want to uh, please refer to tonight's beautiful program. It's a, really a book uh, for the order of show, participant bios, a profile and list of Sandra's many accomplishments, some essays, and an incredible array of heartfelt and moving tributes from so many outstanding writers and friends of Sandra. You should have received a copy with your last Zoom reminder, but if not, you can find it on our website at chicagoliteraryhof.org. The Chicago Literary Hall of Fame honors, celebrates, preserves, and promotes the development of Chicago's great literary heritage, past, present, and future. We realize uh, this mission by annual inductions of outstanding writers from the past, of course, but also by honoring living writers whose lifetime contributions to the literary arts warrant the highest recognition. Sandra Cisneros' contributions are certainly very much in keeping with the ideals of the Fuller Award. It's called the Fuller Award for Lifetime Achievement, but I want to add the words so far. Lifetime achievements so far. <laughs> I'm sure that we'll hear much more out of Sandra during her extraordinary life to come. Uh, this award was inspired by one of Chicago's first literary lights, Henry Blake Fuller, whose two influential novels, The Cliff Dwellers and In the Procession, were groundbreaking in Chicago's post-fire years. Suffice it to say, he was something of a rebel, taking on controversial topics, unafraid of going against the grain, and coming to exemplify the Chicago spirit, like Sandra. Sandra's writing is engaging, powerful, instructive, and as Dorothy Allison writes in her tribute, a provocation. An honest woman, Dorothy writes, is a provocation to the meanness of the world. Sandra's words are balm, the kind that first burns, then heals. As we remember the families of those who have died from the pandemic, and tonight, in particular, the children on the border, we recognize more than ever the need for that healing provocation, along with the uplifting and redeeming power of love, always at the center of Sandra's work. See the arc of this remarkable woman's life and spirit. I invite you to watch this lovely video that begins with Sandra's Chicago days. What would they say? Before there was Iowa City, before there was Provincetown, before there was Greece, France, Yugoslavia, San Antonio, Berkeley, Ann Arbor, even before there was Mexico, there was Chicago. Sandra Cisneros was born five days before Christmas, 1954, in a blue-collar Chicago neighborhood, teeming with myriad languages and cultures. Her father was an upholsterer, and her mother responsible for the upbringing of six children, all boys except Sandra. The family toggled between Mexico and Chicago throughout her young life. The transient nature of her upbringing caused her to feel always like an outsider. This is long before Sandra would write her first poem, much less delight readers with her stories and novels and essays 
including fictionalized accounts of a lonely, awkward girl striving for some kind of belonging and security in a world that seemed disinclined to grant it. Now, of course, Sandra's teachers would say, wow, she has captured a long list of prestigious awards, including NEA fellowships, a MacArthur Fellowship, and the Penn Center USA Literary Award. She has been awarded several honorary doctorates. She even received a National Medal of the Arts from President Barack Obama. Sandra says no. The 2015 National Medal of Arts to Sandra Cisneros for enriching the American narrative. Through her novels, short stories, and poetry, she explores issues of race, class, and gender through the lives of ordinary people straddling multiple cultures. As an educator, she has deepened our understanding of American identity. As a feminist, activist, teacher, and mentor, Sandra has been a leading light to Latinx and young adults throughout the world praising her in many languages, but more so being struck inside her pages and words with the notion that they too will find a path. Chicago had gotten her so far, but she felt the need to leave the city to finish what would come to be considered one of the single most cherished coming-of-age stories ever written. The road to her current home in San Miguel de Allende was long and winding. Along the way, she created literature as diverse as her landscapes. Chicago was the time of bad boys, and in part, the house on Mango Street. Nine books were to follow, more poetry, more stories, children's books, essays, and the big glorious novel, Caramelo. All those tremendous books speak for themselves. She left Chicago as a woman seeking something, to become a woman who others seek. Her place in the great tradition of Chicago storytelling is secure. Sandra has written, I no longer make Chicago my home, but Chicago still makes its home in me. I have stories, Chicago stories I have yet to write. So long as those stories kick inside of me, Chicago will still be my home. We hope, Sandra, that you'll always feel you have a home in Chicago. Tonight, we honor and welcome you back home one more time, even if virtually. And now I'm pleased to introduce tonight's guide through the rest of the Fuller Award celebration, a longtime friend of Sandra's, an esteemed poet from Chicago via Texas, author of four books with two more on the way, as well as poems in different, many different venues. He's an editor at March of Brasso Press and mentor to countless students as a high school teacher. Please welcome Carlos Cumpian. Hi, good evening. It is an exciting evening and uh, it's great our turnout tonight. I first met Sandra in 1974 at the anti-Thanksgiving Turkey Day open mic event in Chicago. And how do I remember this? Because I organized it. I did this in solidarity with the American Indian Movement's goals of putting media attention on American Indian issues. I had only placed a notice though in the Chicago Reader and posted a few flyers and I really had no idea who was going to be in attendance, attendance besides myself. Uh, maybe we had a total of nine people gathered when we started at 2 p.m. and Sandra was among those. Well, everybody got to read and Sandra certainly read and she shared her short poems. 
And I thought, okay, here's a poet who knows how to read and read well. And also she demonstrated that she had patience and she listened politely as everybody rambled on and 90 minutes flew past and people made for the door. And as they were leaving, I was thanking everybody and trying to get phone numbers for further readings. And she provided me with hers. And she also mentioned that she was gonna be taking classes soon to go for that BA and she's gonna be busy. So the next time I saw Sandra was at the second anti-Thanksgiving day reading that was held in 1976 um, at the Great American Coffee House on Lincoln Avenue. From that moment on, we began renewing our, our contacts and slowly we became better acquainted across the years at various open mic poets with places like Paul Wagoner's gallery where the Banyan Press series was uh, happening. Well, Sandra was 25, roughly 25 going on 26 when her first chapbook, Bad Boys, came out. Sandra asked me to MC at the Liberia Yuki Yu, which was in her neighborhood, and I was glad to do that. I also designed the, uh, the flyer for that evening. And I felt, I think that cemented our relationship, our friendship. And in the 40 plus years I've known Sandra, I, like so many others, of course, have appreciated her books, her essays, her personal letters uh, before and after her migration from Chicago to San Antonio and recently, of course, to Mexico. Um, but most of all, um, I think that as I look back and I think about this, I'm really thankful that I've had this generous friend who's been able to be that university recruiter, that alternative high school teacher, a contributing editor to various small press publications, a literary workshop leader, a poetry promoter, an inspiration for the young and not so young who are looking to understand writing, poetry, and following your dream. Now, again, it's a privilege to be here tonight in this ceremony honoring our Chicago and international multi-talented writer, Sandra Cisneros, but there was someone by the name of Norma Alarcón, a visionary who launched the Third Woman Press back in 1981. And she put Sandra, she knew, hey, here's talent. I'm putting her right on my editorial board. And that's where we get uh, this noted Chicana theorist and scholar, Professor Emeritus of Ethnic Studies of the University of California, Berkeley, who received her doctorate in Latin American literature and culture from Indiana University. Uh, she established through her essays that she was a uh, pioneer in Chicana studies, paving the way for theories and the Chicana and Latina subjectivity. And for 25 years, she owned and operated Third Woman Press, uh, which really put on the map a lot of people like Ana Castillo, Sandra Cisneros, and, and also visual people uh, like Diana Solis. So with that, uh, she's also now currently living, I believe, is that right, Norma, in New Orleans? And, yes. Okay. And she's down there in New Orleans, and uh, she's working on a collection of essays I'm looking forward to reading. So, uh, damas y caballeros, uh, quiero presentar a compartir las palabras de Norman, Norma Alarcón. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, that was very nice. Thank you. My name's still misspelled, but that's my experience in Anglolandia. Anyway, back in uh, 1970 something, 88, 78, 79, uh, I, wrote, uh, I, I wrote an essay for a Third Woman, first issue of Third Woman Press, in which the introduction said, I can inventarnos, we must invent ourselves. Well, I have lived many places, However, I have always considered Chicago my home in the United States. That's where Chicago is always in my heart. It's like the, it's like the little epigraph you had from Sandra. Even though I don't live there, it has always been in my heart ever since, ever, forever. And uh, I arrived here in Chicago in 1955, uh, less than a year after Sandra was born. We met 20 years later, more approximately about the time that Carlos mentioned, 
Uh, and later I have known her for, I have known her all together for about 45 years. And it has been one of my most prized friendships and literary alliances I've ever had. It was her enthusiasm and creative energy that compelled me to become a publisher and editor of Third Woman Press. And I'm holding up the first issue that we did together. At the time we met, we were both struggling to secure our career path. Sandra is a writer and I in pursuit of a PhD for a career in academia. To date, I've had the pleasure of bearing witness to the struggle of the creative writer. It is not easy to put pen to paper and sculpt the poem, the story, the essay. When I met her, she was relatively fresh out of the Iowa Writers Workshop. She was seeking her independence and with a stubborn self-reliance and self-determination and risking poverty it was motivated, I think, by her strong belief that she was a writer. She knew who she was and is. I had never met a young woman like her before. Once she invited me to her apartment on Polina Street where this photo was taken by Diana Solis. I asked her, do you live alone? Which surprised her, but the fact that I was living alone, that she was living alone surprised me. I had always wanted that too. I have met many writers and she has been an exceptional, exceptional enthusiasm for upcoming young writers of all ethnicities. I think that's the Chicago influence, a multi-ethnic, multi-racial city. That reality influenced me as well. And though I have to remember, well, it's signal <clears throat> uh, segregatedness, it's too bad. <clears throat> it, on this issue, I wrote the call for self-invention. I came to Intagnos. Ditch the feminine stereotypes of Latina cultures, as my mentor Rosario Castellano said back at that time. That same year, the first issue of Third Woman Press, Gloria Ansaldúa wrote her writing manifesto and philosophy in bridge, speaking in tongues. She asks, <clears throat> Why am I compelled to write? Because the world I create in the writing compensates for what the real world does not give me. By writing, I put, I put order in the world, give it a handle so I can grasp it. I write because life does not appease my appetites and hunger. I write to record what others erase when I speak, to rewrite the stories of others have mis miswritten about me, about you to become more intimate with myself and with you, to, dis to dispel the myths that I am a mad prophet or a poor suffering soul, to convince myself that I am worthy. Finally, I write because I am scared of writing, but I'm more scared of not writing. She lays out justification, motivation, and desire. Sandra has also noted the healing properties of writing, a, med a medicinal curative, a potion of transcendence. Third Woman itself with Sandra on board became a vehicle for self-invention and reconstruction. Sandra's support across the years had meant much to do with it. As I reflect on the matter, I think that most women writers of the Western world of at least the 200 years might have thought as much. Uh, what about men? Congratulations, Sandra. Thank you. Thank you, Norma. Muchísimas gracias por sus palabras. Thank you. Uh, damas y caballeros, some of you who have been in Chicago or were in Chicago when the legendary Guild Books was not only a place for books, and it never was just a place for books. It was a place for art, photography, 
And then we had the annex for poetry, music, and it became our go-to cultural center managed by legendary uh, Richard Bray at 2456 North Lincoln Avenue. Uh, he was doing that from the seven, year 79 through 1988. It all went too fast for me. I just wish it, it would have gone on. Uh, and during that time, the Guild supported so many different national authors, many of them uh, with Chicago roots, uh, Sterling Plump, Cyrus Coulter, Angela Jackson, Maxine Chernoff, Gwendolyn Brooks, David Hernandez, Tony Fitzpatrick, Haki Marabuti, um, Reginald Gibbons, Michael Anania, uh, all these great writers. And, and there was Richard, not just making sure things were in place and going, and he was finding the great volunteers too. He had a great body of volunteers working with him. But he was also had skills beyond the world of the books. And he had skills as a railroad brakeman, cab driver, community organizer, factory worker. Um, he's also done things like, uh, so, you know, working towards uh, the executive director. He worked as the, a decade as executive director for Freedom to Write for the Penn West in the LA area. And uh, he did six years also this is really his prison sentence, his six years as a librarian for the Pasadena Public Library in Alameda County in California. Richard Bray, we miss you. Let's hear from Richard tonight. All right, brother. Thanks, Carlos. It's good to see you. It's great to be back in Chicago, even virtually. Um, I first met Sandra 40 years ago like some of you in 1980, when she came into our bookshop with her backpack full of bad boys, her first chapbook, and asked if we would carry her new title and if she could post her flyers advertising her writing workshops. That began a friendship that continues to this day. The folks at Guild Books love Sandra and she returned the appreciation and affection. Sandra told me that Guild Books played an important role in the education of her mother, who would tell her, call Guild Books and order this book for me. The book was always a title she had heard on the Studs Turkle show, which she listened to religiously. Sandra says that Studs was her mother's professor and Guild Books was her mom's library. Sandra was really struggling in her career as a writer in those days <clears throat> and went through some very difficult times. I was able to provide some help connecting her to Susan Burkholz, who became her literary agent. But it wasn't just me helping Sandra. She also helped me and the bookstore, just as she's helped so many other people throughout her life. Sandra as was mentioned, would sometimes volunteer at the bookstore. And we were all touched by her kindness in doing so. She did bigger things to help us as well. One memorable example was when Sandra organized over 50 writers uh, to read an event that she named Writers to the Rescue to raise money for our struggling shop. She turned around the traditional relationship of bookstores helping writers and worked hard to unite the Chicago literary community around helping the bookstore. The Writers to the Rescue event raised some desperately needed money in those early years. But more important than the money was the tremendous role Writers to the Rescue played in strengthening the communication and the sense of community among Chicago's extraordinary writers and readers. I believe this is more important than the money because the real bottom line of the Guild was the social profit it generated. Sandra planted the seed and it led us into helping form a network of multi-ethnic, feminist, and other independent bookstores from every corner of Chicago. And to develop connections with librarians, with school teachers, 
who then helped promote the work of Sandra and other young writers whose work had not received the exposure it deserved. I remember when The House on Mango Street came out and Sandra's reading filled the store with young Chicanas and with school teachers and librarians and others filling the chairs and overflowing onto the floor. You could hear and feel yourself witnessing something really special happening in Chicago. Getting to know Sandra during my early years at Guild Books was one of the great joys of my professional life. The staff and I, of course, yearned for the success of Sandra and many other young writers who graced our store with their presence. We provided them with a space to read and perform and made a special point of carrying the most extensive collection of chapbooks, poetry books without a spine in custom built poetry racks. Writers would point out that in addition to caring and promoting their books, the shop also provided the kinds of books and journals they needed to read in order to help nurture them in relation to the kind of writers they wanted to become. The story of Sandra Cisneros, who gave us so much love and has had so much deserved success is a wonderful example of all of this. And it's a great honor for me to be here and have the opportunity to tell a small part of that story tonight. Thank you. Richard Bray, thank you for your words. Looking over at the uh, other people that are lined up tonight, we have someone who is in the land where Sandra lived and worked with the Guadalupe Cultural Center, and that land is San Antonio. And there we find Sonia Saldivar Hall. So I'm talking about Sonia Salvador, I'm sorry, Salvador Hall in the Brackenridge Endowed Chair of Literature and the Humanities and the Interim Chair for English at the University of Texas, San Antonio. She was the founding director for Women's Studies and Women's Studies Institute. Currently, she is co-editing with Geneva Gano, an anthology, I Do Critical Essays on the Work and Career of San Francisco Neros. Her book, Feminism on the Border, Chicana Politics and Literature, was published by the University of California Press. She currently is also working on essays on the life of Gloria Anzaldúa and has served as a co-editor for the Latin American Otherwise from Duke University Book Press from 97 to 2020, 20, 2020. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce her as we have. And now she has a very magnificent background. Go ahead, Sonia, share your words. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carlos. You're welcome. Uh, so I've known Sandra a long time, uh, as, as she likes to say, before she was Sandra Cisneros. <clears throat> I first met her at a Chicano Studies Conference held in Austin, Texas on March 9th, 1984. I have the exact date because I have the program. The house on Mongo Street was hot off the press. I don't remember the color of her dress, but I do remember those red shoes. It was love at first sight. As she read, actually she performed her excerpts from what I call a fronteriza or border text. I, I really wept, I wept. Sandra's powerful lyrical words moved me as no other literary text ever had. At that reading, I experienced a personal and intellectual epiphany, a conocimiento as Gloria Anzaldúa calls it, about this radical new form of American literature. The new form, of course, is a Chicana feminist literature that Cisneros herself pioneered and that we now know of as, as, and we now know as a facet of Sandra Cisneros' studies. This is what I had been waiting for. This was an American literature that I needed to study, research, and teach. That day, Sandra's words opened up a new world for me. And as so many of our students proclaim, and, and many of you here tonight might say, she changed my life. My own early readings of Mango Street were based on the Chicana feminist theories that emerged throughout her book. The sexual, racial, and geopolitical materialize in the characters' lived experiences as working class people of color 
in the Chicana Chicanx borderlands. The house on Mango Street is not Virginia Woolf's house of her own, but a working class dwelling inhabited by US women of, and girls of color. From her first publication, Bad Boys, to Caramelo, to A House of My Own, and the more recent Puro Amor, Sandra Cisneros has been in the vanguard of a thriving Chicana feminist and literary political movement in the late 20th, early 21st centuries. As well, her role as a public intellectual is reflected in her many opinion pieces in the, main, in the mainstream, mainstream press. Cisneros' crucial political interventions in those editorials are as a powerful feminist writer who passionately advocates for peace and human rights and dares to voice incisive cultural critiques. This important part of the Cisneros canon is her work as a public intellectual and political activist. Sandra Cisneros practices strategies of transfrontera feminism in her relentless crossing of borders. I argue that all of her writing is political. One example is the 1998 editor editorial in the LA Times on the La Latin Latino MacArthur Fellows. If the Times imagined they were gonna get a story about the individual accomplishment of these great geniuses, what they got was Cisneros' narrative of the 1997 massacre of 46 women, children, and men in Actial, Chiapas. In the days immediately after the Matanza, the, gov the Mexican government presented it as a family feud between political partisans. But Cisneros interrupted the mainstream national discourse of both the US and Mexico and exposed what happened was a concerted military action by the federal troops against indigenous people fighting for their land. She propelled the actions across fronteras when she interrupted that dominant discourse with a Chicana feminist counter narrative on how we must take action. I know the deaths in Chiapas are linked to me here in the US, she wrote. I know the massacre is connected to removing native people from their land because although the people are poor, the land is rich and the government knows this. Cisneros fully understood, understood her position of power, asking what is my responsibility as a writer in light of these events, as a woman, as a mestiza, as a US citizen who lives on several borders, the stories she tells in these public forums challenge what's expected from a traditional intellectual. Cisneros' political discourse, including a daring and some would say scandalous acceptance speech when she received the Texas Medal of Arts Award in 2003, illustrates how Chicana intellectuals transform static identities since their differential consciousness, as per uh, Chela Sandoval, and Anzaldúa's conocimiento demand that they testify to hidden transfrontera realities. In her work, Sandra answers core questions posed by Latina Latinx theorists about our relationship to political identities and intellectual work to building new paradigms and models. Sandra Cisneros continues that work as a political writer alongside her exquisitely lyrical literary productions. She consistently breathes fire and new life into static notions of the responsibility of Chicana Chicanx intellectuals. In all of her writing, she dares to tell, and in so doing, she offers Chicana decolonial feminist tools as she interrupts the design of the empire. And for all of this, I thank you, Sandra. Profundo. Lasso Kamal. Thank you, Sonia. Um, moving to our next emerging new leader, Jorge Valdivia is a Chicago native who grew up in La Villita, which we all know is one of the main hubs of Mexicanidad in Chicago Southwest side. Valdivia is an arts consultant, special focus on the performing arts, uh, amplifying the voices. He's dedicated to amplifying voices for the Latinx, LGBTQ Latinx communities throughout the arts. And he's also served as an arts cu curator for the National Museum of Mexican Arts, responsible for things like 
the performing program of the Sofuana Festival, which is one of the largest festivals celebrating women performing artists of Mexican descent. Valdivia is also a consultant and co-curator of the Chicago Latino Theater Alliance. Valdivia has served on boards and consuls and organizations that reflect his passion for the Latino LGBTQ issues, including most recently the, victim gar the Victory Gardens, Consul and Community Leaders, Latinos Progresando's Mex Talks Host Committee. And I've had the pleasure of recently speaking to him at length about things that are happening. And I think he'll give us some insight into his encounter with our wonderful Sandra Cisneros. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, just share some personal stories um, of how I've gotten to know Sandra throughout the years. Um, first of all, I just wanna acknowledge that on Tuesday of this week, we celebrated Women's International Day. I think it's only fitting that tonight we've come together to pay tribute to a woman that I deeply admire and respect. If it's okay with you, I'd like for you, I'm gonna ask you to humor me a little bit and allow me to just share a little bit about myself. I promise that it, it's all connected to Sandra's stories later. So I grew up in La Villita, uh, in Chicago. Just uh, I grew up in Chicago, like Sandra, um, in La Villita, a little village to be specific. Uh, my mother, Maria Canchola Valdivia, uh, got as far as third grade. As a child, I'd sit on the red carpet floor of my parents' bedroom. And from there, I'd stare at my mom as she cooked every day. She always had this pink boom box that she'd place on top of her white and yellow speckled Formica countertop. She cook and sing along to the songs of Rocio Durca, Vicente Fernandez, and Vicky Carr, and so many others. It's funny because even though my mother's a great cook, cooking sometimes put her in a bad mood. But singing, singing always put her in such a great mood. Eventually, my mother, the woman who got as far as third grade, started writing her own po poetry and songs. She'd sit and record her songs into the pink boombox that nobody was allowed to touch. Those are still some of the most beautiful lyrics I've ever heard. Eventually, she started performing different at different festivals and events throughout Chicago. On one of her visits back home to Jalisco, they asked my mom uh, if she wanted to perform at an outdoor festival. Without missing the beach, she said, yes. More invitations followed to other festivals at nearby cities. And before you know it, my mom was on a short tour in Mexico. She even made it on local TV and newspapers, but family obligations forced her to stop and come back home. I know that there was a great part of my mother that always wished she had more time to pursue her dreams of singing. And I think that's a reality for a lot of women, for a lot of Mexicana women. So fast forward to 2012, um, we invited Sandra Cisneros to, uh, to come to Chicago along with the visual artist, an amazing visual artist and friend of Sandra in the museum named Esther Hernandez. We wanted them to present Sandra's book, Have You Seen Marie? Esther uh, had done the illustrations for the book and having them both together to present the book was Sandra's idea, to be honest. If you know Sandra, you know she's an advocate for the arts and for artists. After the event was over, I invited Sandra and Esther to dinner. As we drove past streets, she remembered she'd sometimes smile and share stories here and there of her time in Chicago. And I honestly felt honored to be able to get to listen to those stories. A few moments later, we ended up in Greektown where we talked and we talked and we talked some more. And Sandra also talked about the harsh reality of never really feeling appreciated here in her home city as she was trying to get her work out there. I can only imagine how difficult it must have been for a woman, a proud brown woman, for someone who had so much to say and was fighting for an opportunity to have her work get out there. But that's the reality for women of color. That was the, uh, the reality for women of color back then. And that continues to be the reality for women today and people of color. At one point, we were talking about female sexuality and how oftentimes it's seen as a taboo to discuss such things in our culture. I seized the moment to share a story my sister had shared with me when my mother decided to finally talk to her about sex. It was a very uncomfortable conversation, my sister said, where a lavadora or a laundry machine was used as a metaphor for men and ropa sucia or dirty laundry was used as a metaphor for 
sexual needs. My sister was 27 years old. My mom was a little late. And while I won't exactly share the story I shared with Sandra and Esther, I can tell you that I had them laughing so hard. And then Sandra paused for a moment. She put her hand on my shoulder and said, you have a gift for storytelling. Use it. We need you. We need more people like you who are telling our stories. All I could do was say thank you. Throughout the years, I've learned a few things about Sandra. I learned that when she came to Chicago to present the book, Have You Seen Marie? She was still healing from the loss of her mother. I've learned that her love of museums, books and art was doing great part to her mother as well. A Mexican woman who very much like my mother Maria had sacrificed so much for her family. I've learned that she will always take the time to talk to people from our community and encourage them to become storytellers as well. I learned that she, she has an amazing memory for detail. I've learned that Sandra genuinely cares about her artist friends. I've learned that she loves to connect people who should meet. She's taught me that it's okay to talk about the complexity of the relationships we sometimes have with our family. Sometimes we don't, we, we don't talk about it, but we should. I've also learned that she loves her perritos, her dogs, and they like to make cameo, uh, cameos during her interviews. I learned that sometimes you have to leave the home you know in order to get to where you need to be. Our conversations felt like home. They felt familiar. They felt like a cobija or a San Marcos blanket on a cold uh, Chicago winter night, like pan dulce and hot chocolate on a brisk Sunday morning. I found comfort in the stories Sandra and Esther shared with me, and I finally understood her complicated relationship with Chicago. My question to you is this, why is it that sometimes an artist has to leave home in order to finally be, be appreciated? When the time came to say goodbye, I felt like I was saying goodbye to family. And I went to the airport, Sandra said to me, I wanna thank you for this trip to Chicago. Puzzled, I replied, thank me, thank me why? And she said, yes, I wanna thank you because for so long I've had such a complicated history with the city. And on this trip, I felt like I was finally able to mend my relationship with Chicago. So thank you. I said, you're welcome, but honestly, I was caught off guard and um, I, did, I, I didn't know what else to say. But then Sandra, without missing a beat, said to me, I still want you to think about what I told you. Think about telling your story. Think about telling our story. We, know, we need more people like us out there telling our stories because if we don't tell our stories, someone else will, uh, someone else will tell them for us. Sometimes we have to walk through the fire and burn a little in order to get to where we need to be, she said. Sandra, I wanna thank you for having the courage to tell, to tell your story and to tell our stories. I wanna thank you for being such a fierce luchadora, a trailblazer. I wanna thank you for showing us that it's okay to be a terca and insisting que si se puede. I wanna thank you for helping tell the much needed narrative of the Mexican, American, Chicana, Chicano experience in the US. Thank you for bringing out the Mexican in all of us. And thank you for being like a comadre to the National Museum of Mexican Arts. Um, I'm sure if you ask anyone here tonight, they'll agree that you live by a motto that my mother taught me and all of us as children. No vengo a ver si puedo, sino, porque, sino que vengo porque puedo. I'm not here to see if I can do this. I'm here because I know I can. Gracias, Sandra. Se te quiere mucho. Hi, all. Um, my name is Don Evans, and I'm the founding executive director of the Chicago Literary Hall of Fame. I know you are all eager, excited to hear Sandra, and I'm not going to be the guy that's going to keep you from that very long. I just wanted to say a little bit about the Fuller Award. Um, the first one we gave out was in 2012 to Gene Wolfe, and that was a, a glorious ceremony that we did at San Filippo Estate in North Barrington. And then after that, it was Harry Mark Petrakis at the National Hellenic Museum. And then it was Hakim Adabudi at the Poetry Foundation. And then we gave one to Rosalind Brown and Angela Jackson. 
and Stuart Dybeck and Sarah Paretsky and Sterling Plump. These are amongst our very best living writers. We adore them, um, admire them for their work and for their life. And this was the idea behind the Fuller Award to be able to celebrate that as a community. And so many of our partners are um, here tonight that have joined in all of Chicago and across the country in North America. And usually, we're, this is the first time we've done this virtually. Um, usually I hand off the statue or somebody else hands off the, the statue. Uh, that saves me a trip to the post office. Uh, but here it is, it's a beautiful um, statue. I think you can see it. Um, it says, the Chicago Literary Hall of Fame's Fuller Award for Lifetime Achievement, Sandra Cisneros, March 13th, 2021. And uh, Sandra will get that in Mexico uh, soon, uh, along with some of the printed programs. Um, and so, um, you know, I think this is really, you know, it's a cliche when people say, Sandra needs no further introduction, but I think we've done all the introducing we need. And so now um, the recipient of this spring's Fuller Award for Lifetime Achievement from the Chicago Literary Hall of Fame, Sandra Cisneros. Congratulations, Sandra. Thank you. Wow, this has been so um, emotional. I didn't think it was gonna be so emotional. And uh, I, I love seeing everyone. It's just so wonderful to uh, see the messages popping up and friends from all over the globe. Thank you so much for organizing this. Is this my moment that I can read my speech now? This is it. Oh, okay, all right. Um, this is brand new. And uh, I haven't read it out loud, so I'm, I'm still sh a little exhausted from just finishing it. But it, it's probably going to be in a different version when it gets published, and it'll be bigger. But I didn't want to take too much time. Thank you, all of uh, the guests, all my friends, new and, new and old, uh, for this reunion. Because Jorge is right, I did have a very complicated relationship with Chicago. And writing this essay, uh, so um, healing for me. So here it here goes. I saw a video of a kite festival in Taiwan where a little girl tangled in the tail of a tempestuous kite was plucked from the land, wind whipped and whisked 30 feet into the air alongside inflatable pandas and giant dragons. She performed several wild loop-de-loops, tumbled and dived dangerously close to damage before gale ceased and weather benevolently brought her back to earth. I imagine she saw some wondrous things on her remarkable abduction. Distance brings a story into focus. The farther away a story, the better you can see it. Thus, the fates have unreeled my life enough to let me whip around the thinnest ether and from these dizzy heights see with clarity my windswept years. My earliest memory, 63rd Street off Ashland, a second story apartment rear, two shoes attached to my feet and a broom moving a pile of dust near. When the broom finally nudges my toes, I jump as if electric and leap over the dust pile. This was the moment I was born. Well, it's when I believed was the moment of my birth. It was the most ancient memory in my childhood archive, and I always assumed this was when I first entered the world. But my story begins before birth. It is 1954. I am curled in my mother's belly waiting to somersault into being. On the back porch, my mother meets a little blonde girl from Appalachia. I see this skinny child hanging from the porch rail, swinging upside down, unashamed to flash her flowered underwear. She's as pale as baby corn or a fish born in a cave. A girl with fizzy eyes and blue currents visible under her flesh. Even her hair is transparent as chamomile tea. 
What's your name? My mother asked. Sandra, says Blondie, and drags the syllables as if they are ocean receding from land. Sandra, my mother puts this name in her apron pocket and saves it for when I am born. When my mother first tells me this tale, I am a girl the age of my blonde namesake. I can imagine the little girl in my mind, but not my mother. I have a hard time seeing my mother in these stories my mother tells me from before, even though the stories from before are my favorites. I ask especially for stories from when my mother was my age, but I can't imagine my mother as a kid. Instead, I imagine my mother with her familiar mother face, and I paste this mother head onto a child's small body, like the cartoons on the glass storefront across the street. The cartoons painted on the storefront across the street are of men with giant heads and little bodies riding tiny cars. My brother Kiki tells me we lived across the street from a car dealership. Was this when we lived on top of my father's shop, the one we called the store? And was the store the upholstery shop my father shared with his two brothers, a short-lived business venture that led to lifelong wars? Maybe I mix up this shop address with busy 63rd Street with the car dealership across the street. The early world of mine on 63rd Street appears in sharp focus in several dream cities with their dream city streets, even as it blurs when I'm awake. On 63rd, my two older brothers and I are sent on errands to the A&P supermarket alone. My brothers, who are two and four years older than I, seat me in the shopping cart's child seat, where I sit facing backwards. Then they push the cart furiously down the aisles as fast as they can and let go. It's thrilling to race through the world facing backwards. My brothers have to run to catch the runaway cart before I crash into a tower of soup cans. We like this game and do it over and over. No one tells us not to. There are color photos from the time we lived on 63rd, all with a strange blue wash, as if we are watching ourselves on the moon, images with serrated edges and a date printed on the border. The corners dog-eared because we never knew we were supposed to keep them in albums, but stored them in shoe boxes. These photos prove without a doubt our second floor rear apartment was almost empty with just a scratchy couch, a cheap coffee table, armless chairs, beds, a torchier lamp, and a floor humbly dressed with linoleum. It is obvious there isn't a lot of money here. Ay caray, we are amolados as they say in Mexico, broke, but nobody told this to my father. From my windy vantage, I can see clearly my happiest moments in Chicago are my childhood Christmases. As a kid, my father was given clothes every holiday by his practical parents. That's why on our December 25th, our linoleum floors overflowed with toys beyond the tree and the front room, sometimes into the next room. Dolls that smelled like balloons and aluminum dish sets with silverware so soft they bent when you put them in your mouth. Metal dump trucks, howdy doody and little Abner dolls, cowboy hats and holsters and pistols, punching bags, rocket ships, tugboats, red mesh Christmas stockings from Woolworths. My father loved watching his kids open their presents on Christmas morning. Where did my father get the money for so many cheesy wonders? And how did my parents manage to hide the loot from a house full of kids? Who knows? Each Christmas was more spectacular than the Perry Como holiday show. My mother, 
was the practical parent. She wasn't imaginative when it came to our everyday meals, but she went all out when it came to treats. One winter, she made ice cream from carnation, evaporated milk, and fresh Chicago snow. On Halloween, she created taffy apples and once even popcorn balls. Her specialty, ugly apple pies that tasted delicious. Bread with fruit filling from cans our Uncle Pete brought home from the Solo factory where he worked. I still crave my mother's ugly but delicious apple pies. It's also here on 63rd Street where our neighbor, a black teenager named Mary, babysat us one evening and introduced me to a new dish. It was the most spectacular spectacular invention in the world since pancakes. We were watching the Miss America pageant. During a commercial, Mary went into the kitchen and I watched her arrange slices of bread on a plate, spread peanut butter over each, and top this off with grape jelly. She folded each and gave one to me. I ate mine in the living room where Miss America was quickly eclipsed by this exotic invention. When I finished, I asked for seconds and Mary kindly made me another. I am grateful for the apartment at 4006 West Gladys off Pulaski Avenue near Madison that introduced me to a beautiful pub public library, the Legler Branch, where I applied for my first library card before I even knew how to print my name. Our house was the first on the north side of the block, alongside a long wooden fence hiding the back of the grocer's laundry tavern and cleaners facing Pulaski. Two Chinese men ran the laundry. These two gave me the most valuable gift an adult can give a child. They listened. Once I wore a white blouse that had a fancy gold letter embroidered above my heart. I couldn't read yet, but I was convinced this was a Chinese letter and marched over to the laundry to prove it. Is this Chinese? I asked, pointing to the arabesque on my blouse. Yes, they both agreed. That's Chinese, all right. What does it say? It says, Sandra. I went home, please. A Mexican girl named Griselda, with a face as round as the moon, lived upstairs with her Mexican brother, Jacinto. They shared their apartment with a father with a caterpillar mustache and caterpillar eyebrows, and a mother with the same moon face as Gris. She was supposed to be their mother, but she slept a lot and sometimes forgot to feed them. Then Gris and Jacinto watched us from our kitchen window until my mother had to invite them to our table. Mother complained about the moon-faced mother upstairs, but I liked her, especially when she climbed out of bed and joined us coloring coloring books for hours. We lived next door to the Audi home the juvenile detention center when we moved to Roosevelt Road, corner with Levitt Avenue. We paid $50 a month for the servants' quarters on the top floor of a once beautiful brownstone that had been a lawyer's mansion a century earlier. Now it was divided into three ap apartments with noisy Tejanos downstairs who played conjunto music at outrageous hours, especially when we most wanted to sleep Sunday mornings. On Fridays, walking home from St. Callistus, my brother Kiki would ask the same question. Are you happy? And I would answer the same answer. Yes, I'm happy. This was Kiki's cue to ask, why are you happy? And then I'd say, mm, because today is Friday, because we don't have to go to school tomorrow, because tomorrow we get to sleep late and watch cartoons, because Papa gets paid today, because tonight we go to the Sears. 
the Sears Roebuck and Company headquarters on Holman Avenue was as huge and imposing as a penitentiary. Friday evenings, I tagged along with my parents religiously to scour the bargain basement where defected or damaged goods ordered from the Sears Roebuck catalog were returned and resold at reduced prices. This is where I bought my first book, a copy of Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland, in a paperback edition that had once belonged to a box set. It was an ugly book with a red cover and garish circus yellow edges on the pages. I loved it. We walked too quickly through the Sears toy section where I would moon over a luxury of Barbie dolls and their fabulous costumes ridiculously out of reach of my 50 cents a week domingo. Mother thumped washers and dryers till I was bored. And then I was sent to look for my father, who was lost in the sea of 37 television sets, all tuned into the Red Skelton show. Before we left for home, we, stepped at the, we stopped at the candy counter and bought a box of popcorn for the kids, a hot fistful size bag of precious cashews for mother, and a bag of glazed peanuts for father. Sears was better than the circus. I don't know how mother saved enough money to take seven kids and two adults to the ice capades at the Chicago Stadium, but she did. We went for the first and only time and witnessed the beautiful Olympic skater Peggy Fleming. Father preferred hauling his kids to Soldier Field to watch Mexican soccer games, but he had to stop allowing his only daughter to tag along after the crowds got too rowdy with palabrotas and fistfights breaking out, often more entertaining than what was happening on the field. Father's favorite things to shop for were toys, his English wingtips from Maxwell Street, television sets, and cars. Father's big splurge was for tickets for the auto show at McCormick Place, but he could only afford to take mother, me, and one brother. This was before he bought his red Chevrolet station wagon, but he would be forced to sell this beloved vehicle when the pipes froze in our brownstone apartment the winter of 1966, and we bought a house in Humboldt Park, the basis for my book, The House on Mongo Street. My best memories of Chicago are of the excursion that's cost us nothing. The libraries every, every Saturday were my alone time with mother. The classical concerts in Grant Park, museums on Sunday when admission was always free. I pretended those Greek mansions were my house, the collections all mine, and the visitors my guests who had come to seek me out, but I was disguised as a little girl. When we were kids, we were especially fond of the Field Museum because of the mummies who slept in the basement and the giant mastodons roaming the central foyer. Later, as I grew older, I shifted my allegiance to the Art Institute of Chicago, to the Van Goghs, Hokusais, and the Sweet Francusis. When father wasn't looking, mother hiked miles to the nearest Salvation Army, Goodwill, and junk stores on the sneak. I don't know why father made such a big fuss. After all, he didn't mind shopping at Maxwell Street. Maxwell Street was puro teatro. We saw the unforgettable medicine man who wore a chicken on his head to attract customers. We heard the best blues music coming from musicians playing in empty lots. So that when we grew up, we were amazed that people had to pay to hear their blues when we had always heard it for free. I have so much more I need to write the Guild Bookstore and Women and Children Books that launched me as a young writer, Gwendolyn Brooks, my literary mama, Studs Terkel, my papa, Galeria Quique and the emergency taco poets, Reggie Scott Young, Beatriz Badiquian, Carlos Compian, Cindy Gallagher, Raul Nino, my cousin Licha, and my brother Kiki. We created multicultural events before Harold Washington, before, there was such a word as multicultural. Latino Youth Alternative High School in Pilsen guided my political direction when I worked there. 
The National Museum of Mexican Art created after I left the city, but it's my home now when I return. One of the few, if only museum I know that's free every day. I am taking notes for an essay about Mr. Bill Yamamoto, boss of LaSalle Photo on Diversity, who gave me my first job. And down the street from LaSalle in the same neighborhood, visits to printmaker Carlos Cortez and wife Mariana's house on New Year's Eve. Elders who taught us the valuable lesson, we didn't have to get drunk to be happy. What I remember and love about Chicago is the first day of snow. When you wake and the room is illuminated with that same blue wash as the photos from the 50s from my childhood. What I loved when I lived in Chicago, the last day of snow. Thanks to Chicago, I'm excessively snooty when it comes to food. I tasted my first pierogi in Olga Nahorniak's kitchen. Jamaican meat pies from Daryl, the furniture refinisher at my father's shop. Japanese food, Esther Azuma's homemade lunch shared at the LaSalle Photo Lunchroom. I'm not going to lie, I crave Taylor Street's Italian ice and Ferrara's pastry. What else? Hot dogs, always hot dogs. Everything else isn't real hot dogs. And I miss the Greek diners my father loved. Two eggs, hash browns, ham and toast and coffee. $2.99 back in his day. What did Chicago teach me? To walk down the middle of the street at night. If I didn't want to see rats, go home before dark. Lock the car doors always to this day. Never leave anything valuable in the car. Sit near the driver of the bus or train, not in the back. Avoid being alone in public places, especially in the day. Never use building stairwells alone or go to a bathroom alone if I can help it. I learned to be street smart, even though I was, am, when it comes to love, as dumb as a lamb. All this to say, I hope the three fates will allow more string to unspool before my kite ride is over and the thread snipped. For now, I am enjoying with astonishment and gratitude these diaphanous years. Gracias. Thank you, Sandra. That was beautiful. I want to give you two of these after that. <laughs> um, I'm back just briefly because I wanted to, um, we're going to finish now with uh, uh, an interview with Donna Seaman and Sandra, and then uh, Randy Alberts is going to come back on and he, we've got some people to thank and to say goodbye. Uh, Donna Seaman is a tremendous friend of mine, of the Chicago Literary Hall of Fame, of the American Writers Museum, and virtually every writer. Uh, there are a few um, uh, better interviewers or reviewers or writers out there than Donna. Um, she's an extraordinary talent, um, insightful, smart, compassionate, um, everything you want in really in, in anything, but especially in somebody to lead this conversation with Sandra. Um, Donna is um, the editor for Adult Books at Booklist. She's on the content leadership team at the American Writers Museum. She's won um, a series of, of prestigious awards for her reviewing. She's published several excellent books. Um, so now Donna will um, ask Sandra a few questions and she'll also try to fit in a couple of the audience questions. So Sandra and Donna, take it away. Thank you so much, Don. I was already teary over Sandra's reading. Now I'm very moved by your introduction. And hello, Sandra. It's so great. Hi, to be Donna. Here. So great to see. It's always oh. a joy. As I was saying, you know, when I think of my favorite interviewers, there's like you, Studs Terkel, um, uh, the woman from Fresh Air, and Michael Terry Silverblatt. Gross. Terry Gross and Michael Silverblatt. Oh, you're so generous. Thank and you so truly, much. <laughs> Truly, I think any writer will tell you that because, you know, you do your homework. So it's fun talking to you. You know, when they haven't done their homework, when they say, oh, so uh, what's your book about? 
<laughs> so you wrote a book. <laughs> exactly. Well, I have to say that it was a deep joy to revisit your work, to reread your work. You take such care and precision word by word by word. It's so beautiful. And I discover new things every time. Thank you. So, I just, um, my admiration grows and grows. Thank you. And I guess I'll begin by, you know, of course, thinking about the house, your the house on Mongo Street, um, a house of my own was your beautiful essay collection. And I was thinking today so much about how home has changed for us all over this past year. Um, I've never been so home so much in my life. And I wondered how this had affected you as a writer and affected your sense of community in the world. Yeah, that's a good question, Donna, because, um, you know, when I turned 60, I kind of said, OK, no more blurbs, no more uh, traveling. I'm just going to stay home because the writers I admire, the women writers I admire, all did their best work after 60. So I said, OK, this is like the deadline. You know, I, I'm going to pull an Ursula Le Guin. I'm in sanctuary, do my work. But then, you know, Trump came into office and, you know, uh, the official story was saying such horrible things about immigrants and Mexicans. And I said, oh, no, I got to go out there and do the ministry, the ministry work of talking to audiences and 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 uh, flipping that story. I have to do that ministry work. I can't stay home, you know, so when some school or community or library would, would ask me to come, you know, my, my agent and I would say, well, okay, one more, uh, you know, how, how many books did I blurb? Uh, 27 books, you know, I would do like over and above when even doing two is a lot. And this was all because uh, I, I like to use Elena Poniatowska, the Mexican grand dame of letters, her quote, when the student massacre happened in uh, the 60s, late 60s, she said, I don't, want to be an accomplice to impotency and that's how I felt like I you know I want to do something I live in Mexico what's going on what am I going to do so I did all kinds of things and I said okay next year is going to slow down for sure so the pandemic canceled me right when I was scheduled to go on the road for five cities you know six different hotels every trip was like every two months, it was like a book tour. And, you know, I'm getting older. I can't lug all those suitcases. They damage me. And I'm always like a little burro carrying all this gifts to bring and mail and bringing books back. It's just too much. So the pandemic for me um, forced me to, you know, it kind of gave me a, a, a wake up, a cachetada, slapped me and said, okay, now you have to take care of yourself. And you have to, that's the way you can take care of everybody else. And I had never done that for myself because I'm always, you know, running around trying to complacer, you know, to please. And, uh, you know, at first I thought, wow, this is going to be unusual. I don't think I've stopped flying for, I don't know, maybe 25 years. I don't know how many years. And I felt and I feel that this pandemic has been uh, as tragic as it has been. It's also been mystical. It has been one awakening us to how interconnected we are and to taking care of one another, uh, to realize how interconnected we are with not only people, but the planet and animals and plants. And it was kind of like a reboot, you know, where I was so busy running around that suddenly when everything stopped, um, you know, I had to listen to myself and, and I could write again and I could, uh, uh, do work that I, I realized was going to help a lot more than the gospel according to Sandra and going out there. I didn't have to go out. I, I needed to go in. And I think for some people that's very hard. Uh, for writers, it's our natural state. And, uh, you know, to stop talking and spend more time being at home. I haven't been out in six weeks, by the way. You know, I started going out cautiously and then I pulled back in, just like in the beginning of the pandemic where I stayed in for eight weeks. And um, I just feel as if I'm in a spiritual retreat. I don't think I've ever been uh, feeling more spiritual than I have during this pandemic. When I hear about people's loss, sometimes I have to comfort them. Uh, I watch and read, you know, who's passed away. And it really, we're all living with the broken heart, which is what an artist does. We crack open our heart and we feel things very deeply. But everybody's in that state now everybody's shimmering with the open heart. And I like that quote from the Sufi who said, God breaks the heart, 
again and again until it's a day is open. And I think we're being asked to uh, feel very deeply and to be compassionate and to weep and to break our heart again and again until it stays open for each other, for the planet, for the animalitos. Uh, you know, it's to me a profound uh, spiritual lesson. Very touched by what you say, and it makes perfect sense. <clears throat> I always think of you as a deeply spiritual writer. You have always been. Um, I'm trying. Pretty... In real life, I'm sometimes getting mean and ornery, but in my writing, I'm really good. You're really good. <laughs> That's like my highest self. I can, when I write, I'm like my best self every day. And eh, don't always do it, but I try. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, I love that. that. Writing is your best self. Writing, um, because, you know, that's when you're tapping into your deeper, deeper self and, and deeper space. Exactly. And it's a, a different communion than talking to people live. You're um, going back to your, your muses and your mentors. Um, yeah. And I, I wonder, I, you mentioned um, that you've been writing poetry again. Is that True. You know, I think this is a time for poetry. You know, I think yeah. when people are so angry and, you know, that's where you begin. Uh, and poetry is what we need when we're angry because we're, we're, we're clouded about the real issue. To me, the most difficult writing is poetry because, you know, it, we don't always like what we find out about ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't fool, you can't lie. You cannot lie. If it's a lie, it's not poetry. Poetry is about going very deep and discovering your own truth. And I think this is a time when there's so much going on, so much rage that poetry is, is our medicine that we need as a nation, as individuals, even if we can't write it, to read it, to understand where are we coming from and how do we heal ourselves? You know, when I tell people uh, we need to write poetry, they look at me like I'm telling them go fly a kite, but I'm telling them to go deeply into their own anger and their own wounds and their own unrest and their own demons to travel very deeply and to heal themselves. You know, you know, some people can do it by themselves with poetry and some people need a therapist and some people need a, a mystical experience climbing Mount Everest, what, what, whatever it takes. But I, I think the poets, uh, this is why we have such great poetry happening right now. You know, this, this is the poets are the, in another society, they would have been the visionaries, you know, the curanderos, the healers, and uh, the great poets. So there's so much great poetry coming out of this time. It's, it's amazing time to be alive. Indeed, indeed. Um, <clears throat> I'm also very struck. I mean, there's always nature in your work. And you know, whether it's clouds, trees, plants, um, in Puro Amor, you write about animals. And I know animals are very important to you and, and part of your idea of home. I wonder if you could yes. talk about that pure love. Yeah, you know, I've always loved animals, but I lived with someone who hated animals. You know, my mother, uh, she was from a uh, country. She's, she's descended from country people in this region where I live. And, you know, animals are, are like livestock and now they're supposed to be outside, you know, you watch, you sleep with them. No, you know, so my mother had this whole different notion about animals. But once I had, once I stopped uh, moving and was stationary, uh, I was able to rescue animals and find homes for them. And, you know, my herd is kind of low now because I don't have much of a yard. I only have three, only three, only three. <laughs> yeah. But if you add them together, they would make like one, the size of one guard dog because they're small. But, you know, I, I uh, have been very uh, transformed uh, from owning animals. Uh, you know, I had a parrot when I lived in San Antonio. I had three cats, something like seven or eight dogs. I don't know how many because some of them were just foster you know, foster children that I would find homes for. Uh, but I learned a lot from each of the animals, you know, that, uh, that they have personalities, uh, that they have moods. Uh, and if you understand that like a little tiny bird that doesn't weigh anything has complete personality and is passionate and can fall in love, then you think, oh my God, so do chickens and so do cows and sheep and everything that I eat, you know, so it's just making you a little bit nervous. And I, you know, my friends would come over and say, oh, but your animals are they're different. They have personality. Every animal has a personality. And so does every plant and every rock and mountain and cloud. That's the thing that uh, growing older that I, I like, you know, that I'm still learning. And uh, I feel like I'm in a, a, a very mystical time in my life. I, I hope I have more kite string. 
because I'm just learning so much now. Oh, I hope you do too, and I'm sure you do. Um, I'm, I have one eye on the time here, and I'm gonna take a peek at some audience questions because we've had such an amazing audience out there. Um, and all the speakers today, you know, they're just so moving. I thank them all for their um, homages that they gave today, so beautiful. Yes, and I, I hope everyone reads the program, which Don Evans and company worked so hard on. There's so much in there that's, and many quotes from you. I also <clears throat> quickly want to thank the selection committee. It was such a pleasure to work with them and um, so much passion for you and your work. It was such a joy. Wow, uh, let me you know, ask like, I'm just so lucky because I'm not even dead to get all these nice <laughs> things that people say. I, I have to say that again. I, I am filled with astonishment and gratitude at this time in my life. Oh, yeah. I, and it's such an honor for us to celebrate with you this way. It's been so wonderful. Thank you. Here's a question from an audience member. Um, I like this question because I'm such a reader. Uh, what is your favorite book <clears throat> and what is what advice would you like to share with all of us here? And welcome to everyone favorite? from the south side of Chicago. Like favorite book like, you know, that I've ever read ever? I have so many favorites, but by other authors, I hope that means, right? Not mine. I think, well, I think so. Okay, uh, I think one of the, the, the books that truly changed my life was Thich Nhat Hanh, the Buddhist monk that was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize by Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, his book, Being Peace, which is just a little tiny book with little vignettes, that really changed me because I was so used to, uh, you know, being an activist by, you know, yelling and making a lot of noise and being angry. And I learned a lot from that book about like, if you want peace, you have to be peace. And that doesn't mean you hold up a sign that like means I have, you have to be peace, like with your brother or like your mom, you know, that's hard. That's you know, it's easy to hold up a sign and say, oh yeah, peace. But then you're fighting with people in your community or in your household. So that was just life-changing for me because uh, I had just, uh, uh, it was during the Bosnian war and my, my sister friend, Yasna was uh, uh, you know, out of incomunicada. I didn't know if she was alive or dead. And that just book was major for me. So I, I recommend people read that, especially in times of, of uh, and activism, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, you know, has um, made me more responsible for uh, my words, especially spoken. I'm not so good at spoken, I'm better at written. Because at least when you write, you can revise, but when you speak, it's, yeah. I'm working on it. Oh, I would say you do very beautifully. <laughs> Let me have one more question from um, our audience. And this is a good question for you, Sandra. You're such a mentor. Asking again for advice for beginning writers and poets. What would okay, you do? all right. Well, I have lots of things I usually say, but I always forget that, you know, uh, learning how to uh, be a great writer, it means reading great books. Yeah. So we tell people to read everything, you know, not just, you know, if you're a poet, not just poetry, read all everything. I, I, I think it's important that we read everything. Um, there are a couple of genres that I don't read, but I, it's important to read as, as much as possible. And uh, for young people, I tell people to, uh, you know, if you seriously want to become a professional writer, everybody and their mother is going to say, no, don't do that. <laughs> so you have to uh, make sure that you have a white parachute and that you earn your money from other means. Because assume you'll never make any money from your art, would you still do it? So one, earn your own money. And that means, you know, uh, make yourself as marketable as possible. You know, use all your skills to make yourself marketable. And, and just do the writing uh, as your second profession. It may be how you identify yourself, but it may never be the one that brings you any money. But you're going to do it because you love it. So you earn your own money and you know, don't take money from someone else or they'll tell you how to lead your life. Financial independence, earn your own money. Two, and this is for young people, is very important a choice I had to make, and that is control your fertility. I did not have money to raise myself till I was 40. So I had to make a choice, you know, do I want a child and do I have to move back in my father's home in Chicago? No. So I, I said, no, no kids for me. I'll be Tia. You know, I have lots of nieces and nephews. So the third thing is um, 
to think of solitude as being sacred because when we're young people it's all about like you know who likes me do I have a date I'm so depressed no one loves me but think of that time when you're alone as time that's you can nurture you and I think that um, the pandemic has been uh, a gift for us to listen to our heart to nurture ourselves and absolutely to create because creating nurtures us when our spirit is dying one earn your own money control your fertility solitude is sacred there it is i love it <laughs> so, so right on so um you mentioned this has been a, a time of creativity i think we're all very curious about future projects that we yes, look forward yes. to from you, Can you yes tell us well um that? last year i i finished uh uh, reviewing and working with the new uh, translation of House on Mongo Street for Latin American market, with, which is done with the Mexican novelist Fernanda Melchor. So that's going to be coming out next January, the new, a new translation of House on Mongo Street that is going to be uh, for Latin America. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I also uh, am working with Derek Bermel, the uh, amazing uh, composer, and he has worked on creating uh, music for an opera adaptation of House on Mongo Street. So oh. he and I are working on that. Yeah, that'll be so fun. You know, Amazing. So we've been, we're like draft after draft, but it's so fun to work with him. He's just so uh, intelligent and uh, creative and, and funny. So I enjoy working with him on that. And uh, I have a new book coming out in the fall, uh, a long short story. That's like an oxymoron, a long short story that I began uh, in the 80s and, it, and I put it to sleep and uh, I took it out five years ago and I'm very slow and reworked and, you know, reworked and it's coming out. It's called Martita, I Remember You in a bilingual edition this September. And right now, I'm supposed to be putting my poetry together, which will come out next year, because it's been a long time since people have seen my poems. And uh, that's, that's what I'm working on. I also have uh, some unfinished projects. I was working with a friend of mine, you know, before the pandemic, on doing a show with text and textiles that got put on hold. Mm -hmm. I have interviews that I've done with undocumented people, and that got put on hold, you know, so a lot of things just to you know, been on hold and make me feel like, uh, you know, I got to get going. I got to work harder. I got to get finished. So that's where I'm at. Oh, that's wonderful news. That's very exciting. Oh, I forgot the TV adaptation oh, of House on Mongo yes, Street. Yes, oh, I, forgot. <laughs> I forgot about that because I'm not really, I'm just a consultant. I'm not working on it. But, wow. But, uh, uh, yeah, that's kind of been slowed down a little bit because of the pandemic, but they're, the writer, it, lead writer's working on that, and there'll be a, a television show uh, based on that. I know, I never wanted my, my book to be a movie unless something great could come of it. And this is, you know, now television has matured and done amazing oh, yeah. storytelling, so I thought, <laughs> now, yes. Now, especially, I think I have to thank Trump for motivating me to get my story into people's living room. Because you know, House on Mongo Street is a Chicago story with so many different cultures and people, different colors. It's not a Latino neighborhood. There's all these different people on one block. And where do you see that? But in Chicago. Yes, oh, that's fantastic, Sandra. Thank you so much. And I just wanna that's remind good. you of what you've said, that the difference between a good book and an excellent book is time. That's right. You are so good at remembering what I said. Well, I love that. <laughs> Thank true. you so much for, for speaking with us. Thank you, everyone out there. I Anna, see Randy's. I waiting. always love talking to you. You're just so intelligent and ask great questions. And I just oh. love I just love conversation with a smart persons. So thank you. Oh, and I feel the same. It's such an honor. Thank you so much, Sandra. Thank you, everyone else out there with your good questions. Congratulations again. Yay. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Randy, I know you're ready to take it away. We all, everybody loves talking to Donna. And thank you, Donna. <laughs> thank uh, what you. a great conversation. I think we could go all night. Uh, maybe yes. you have <laughs> lots of kite string, uh, Sandra. <laughs> 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 lots and lots. We have a lot of projects. Uh, I hope you, uh, tonight feels something Thank of you. a powerful uh, force of love you've spoken about so much uh, in Chicago. But I, I've seen uh, I've seen 
tons of things coming up in the chats from people from all the way from South uh, Korea to Saudi Arabia. So you, uh, wow. it's, the whole, uh, it's the whole world that loves wow. you. Wow. Well, this is the nice thing about Zoom is, you know, before we didn't, we couldn't have these events with your friend right. from Taipei can join now and your friend from Bosnia, everybody can join. And that's, that's the, the positive thing about exactly. the Zoom. No, exactly. that's it. On, be on behalf of all of us at the uh, Chicago Literary Hall of Fame, our co-presenters, our partners in the city of Chicago itself, uh, congratulations on your lifetime achievements so far. Uh, <laughs> Thank you so much, Randy. Hearing your voice for a lot of time. So just have a few thanks. Our thanks go, of course, to the creative and unique uh, American Writers Museum. Uh, they were fantastic to work with on this project. You're always uh, wonderful and supportive Chicago Public Library and extraordinary treasure, <laughs> the National Museum of Mexican Art. Uh, we want to thank the Gaylord and Don uh, Dorothy Donnelly Foundation for their support, ongoing support, and individual contributors and many partners listed in your program. I don't have time to read all their names, but I hope everyone who's watching will seek out those and support those terrific organizations fully. They make Chicago second to none as a vibrant incubator for writers here. I just want to add, say one thing. Uh, sure. Like I want to second what Jorge Valdivia said, how healing the last couple of years have been for me with my relationship in Chicago. And would everyone who's watching this, please do something for me. Eat a Chicago hot dog. <laughs> <laughs> Get a library card you used to say. <laughs> Get a no library card and eat a Chicago hot dog. No ketchup. Yeah. <laughs> no. no. We're all gonna go out and have a midnight hot dog. I'm ready. <laughs> oh yay. Uh, I uh, I also of course hope everybody will support the Chicago Literary Hall of Fame. Go to Chicago Literary HOF.org and uh we have uh more fuller awards coming up this fall, two, one for Reginald Gibbons and one for Luis Alberto Uria. So that, mm -hmm. those would be great too. Uh, and my own special thanks to the man Rick Kogan calls the indefatigable Don Evans, <laughs> CLHOF founding executive director for his vision and boundless energy and to the extraordinarily thoughtful Fuller Awards Selection Committee that he co-chaired with that humane, lovely literary light, the inimitable Donna Seaman. <laughs> Whom we, whom we owe as much gratitude as admiration. Uh, again, the members of that committee are listed and I wouldn't be where I am without the help of a great, uh, talented, committed uh, board. And those, including those who worked especially hard on this event, Mary Lavoni, Amy Danzer, Barry Benson, Roberta Rubin, associate board members, Allison Manley, Kelsey Dean and Emily Winkler, and uh, Floyd Sullivan, Melanie Weiss, Julia Borchers from K Publicity and Women and Children First Bookstore. Hey. Uh, special thanks to Sandra's agents, uh, Stuart Bernstein and Susan Bergholtz, uh, as well as to film filmmaker Ray Santisteban and actress Angela Duran for wonderful work on the video tribute. And most of all, thanks to everybody out there from South Korea to Saudi Arabia and beyond uh, for joining us tonight to share in a celebration of one of our truly great writers and human beings. The Chicago Literary Hall of Fame seeks to be Chicago's literary window to the world. And I think we really have been tonight. So Sandra, <laughs> thank you for all you've given us and your exemplary writing and spirited life. This award is so well deserved and we look forward to seeing you back in your home city soon. Me too. Thank you so much to all. Felicidades. Thank you. Everyone, wear your mask and get your shots. So we, we love you, Sandra. <laughs> love, love, love. Thank, Thank you Sarah. all. Thank, Thank you, you all. Stay well. Thank you. Gracias, mil gracias.